curious, how many of you are entrepreneurs? My heart goes out to you. <laughs> what a long and difficult path you've chosen. It can be so lonely and challenging and rewarding and beautifully liberating. I love entrepreneurs. My mother is an entrepreneur. In my childhood, I had a front row seat to her triumphs and struggles. And as an entrepreneur myself, and more often an intrapreneur, I'm an acorn that did not fall far from that tree. I love how brave entrepreneurs are, throwing all caution to the wind and saying, I want to forge my own path. I want to give birth to something new. I want to challenge the way this has been done for decades, because I believe there's a better way. And I especially love entrepreneurs who think beyond themselves, who understand that the choices we make have real consequences and affect people near and afar and affect the earth we all share. Over the last five years, entrepreneurship in the U.S. has almost doubled. In 2014, 13.8% of working-age people were engaged in new or nascent entrepreneurial endeavors. That's over 27 million people. With all these new businesses building their foundations right now, I believe we are at a critical moment. We have an opportunity and an obligation to support this next generation of companies so they build companies that are sound and upon humane and responsible principles. So how do we do this? Incubators and accelerators are popping up left and right. But very few integrate sustainability and ethical practices. Usually, emphasis is on fast growth, huge, or exits with huge profits. And don't get me wrong, money is good. Money is very good. But viability and responsibility can and do work together as brilliant partners. It's the 21st century. This should be standard, even if we have to build new models. So my first career was in architecture, and I still love to build. But these days, I use materials like community, learning, and audacity. I have a history, some might call it an addiction, to building initiatives that empower others. And this usually happens around design, entrepreneurship, and education. So when I learned about this crazy, bold vision that Deb Johnson, the Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator's executive director, when I learned what she was cooking up, I couldn't help but be enticed. I was especially impressed that Pratt Institute was committed to creating a hub for ethical design, and not just for Pratt alum, but for all New York City designers. So much of what I've been doing over the last decade came together here in one place. So when I had the opportunity to join this phenomenal team and to bring this vision to life, there was no question. In some strange way that I can't fully explain, it just felt like home. I mean, look at it. It's so cozy, ripe with potential. <laughs> one year later, and it looks like this. At the heart is the accelerator. We call our Venture Fellow Program. We work with design-based businesses, particularly fashion, product, home, accessories, and technology. We provide structured mentorship in both business development as well as reducing social and environmental impact. And we have space for 25 companies, like the very talented Ms. Suzanne Ray, whose gorgeous dress I'm wearing today. But we also want to extend our support to designers outside our walls, or as Deb would say, how can we share our resources as brilliantly as possible? One of the biggest barriers to scale for an emerging designer is access to affordable production. Most factories require minimums, minimum runs of 100 to 200 units. In our production lab, we focus on no minimums and specialize in 1 to 50 units. We offer cut and sew services, as well as computerized knitting, textile printing, 3D printing, and laser cutting. So you can prototype or create a sample of just about any sort of product or garment. These knitting machines 
are usually found in big factories, pumping out thousands of the same sweater over and over. Really hard for an emerging designer to have access to it. And one of these machines can literally print out an entire sweater in the round, no seams, in 30 to 40 minutes. You can take off the machine, put it on, and walk out the door. It's so cool. I still get excited about it. <laughs> and it's essentially zero waste. So with this production lab, we're also creating local manufacturing jobs. We have, we've hired eight garment workers so far, and we have plans for 15. And because they'll be employees of Pratt Institute, they'll have full benefits, which is almost unheard of in the garment industry. And a really cool side perk, their kids can go to college for free. How many factories can say that? We have researchers that focus on the future of the industries, particularly the intersection of sustainability, technology, and apparel. Our first project is our Sustainable Strategies Lab, what we call the S-Lab, which connects emerging designers with supply chain resources. Because another thing about being an emerging designer is no one wants to send, sell you 100 yards of something. Designers can come here for strategy consultations, peruse the textile library, and learn about the life cycle assessments and impacts of different fiber types. And we're now turning this research into an open source platform, a tool that will be open to all designers everywhere. We also offer classes on things like technical design and, product, or, and uh, entrepreneurship, things you usually don't learn in design school. And we want to create a place for people to gather for critical conversations. So we host events like panels and film screenings, book signings. As you probably know, um, entrepreneurs are often very busy people. So when it comes to sustainability, we often hear, I want to, but I don't have time to do the research. It's so complex, I'm not sure where to start. And our entrepreneurs often feel paralyzed, or worse, ridden with guilt. They want to do it, but don't know how. Sustainability can be overwhelming. It comes at you like a tidal wave. So we break it into pieces that are more accessible. Stepping stones based on your values. What's important to you is a toxicity, or water, or labor practices. We serve as our entrepreneur's chief sustainability officer. And together, we develop a sustainability roadmap tracking out over time the best opportunities so our entrepreneurs are ready to tackle them when they come. This is Tiffany and her team. Tiffany is the founder of Design Hype. They make accessories that empower solo women travelers. So when they started designing their packaging, Tiffany knew she wanted to do a couple of things. First, although it's the norm, she didn't want to have a plastic window in the box because she felt strongly about the packaging being able to be recycled in a single waste stream. Second, her factory ships her product in these little plastic poly bags, and they create a lot of waste. So she wanted to eliminate those. So she found a packaging company located near her factory, so her products could be put directly in the boxes. But when it came to the materiality, she wasn't sure what to ask her manufacturer. So she worked with Carolyn, one of our S-Lab advisors, who provide her with questions to ask on things like particular adhesives and inks. And she ended up with a solution that's 100% recyclable F using FSC certified board and soy inks. When she started producing her, metro, uh, her gold metro cuffs, which you see here, she took a similar path. The typical gold plating process that you use is really chemically heavy. So she researched other options, because that didn't sit well with her. And she found a process that bonds the gold particles physically in a vacuum without chemicals. This process also creates a more durable product, which will extend the lifetime of her product. Now, it's still an energy-intensive pro process, but she's headed in the right direction, and she continues to look for new, te new technologies and materials. This is Mac of uh, his company's Wool and Prints, and they make uh, wool button-down shirts. Um, he's built a really great brand, the quality product, has a steadily growing sales channel, 
sorry, and, lo and really loyal customers. But he's at this point where he's about to dive back into product development, and his time at the BFD has got him curious. He has no knowledge of where his wool really comes from, and has never been able to get clear answers from his agent. So as I speak, Mac is on his way to China, armed with a list of specific questions about the origins of the fiber and the milling and dyeing processes. So he can ask his, fat, his agent and his factory and his suppliers. He's not sure what he's going to find, but he's taking the first step. It doesn't happen all at once, and there's no turnkey solution. Each situation requires a different strategy. So give yourself a break. And what's one action you can integrate into your business today? And another tomorrow? Because it's these small wins that will create momentum. And honestly, when you're early stage, you're not making much impact. But as you scale, these choices get baked into your DNA. And it's really hard to change when you're a large company. You know the saying about how hard it is to turn a large ship? Well, right now, we've got an armada of little dinghies. So I'm trying to set them on a course for success. But no matter how brilliant our mentors are, or what kinds of experts we bring into our space, hands down, our most valuable asset is the, not, the brain trust that exists amongst our entrepreneurs. We believe in helping hands and a collaborative community. We've even crafted good citizenship guidelines that every resident signs. These are essentially our pinky swear to each other, created for the community, by the community. And to encourage openness, we carefully curate the mix of companies so we don't have any direct competitors. And we look for people with heart, whose products have a deep connection to who they are, and whose businesses speak to the life they want to live. We look for people who are bringing at least as much to the table as they're taking from it. And what this leads to is a generous community with a variety of experiences and expertise. We have fashion and product designers, and, uh, MBAs and traders, brand and SEO professionals. This is Teal. He was a corporate lawyer. Now he's the founder of Borm Apparel. When he passed the bar, he had to buy a whole new wardrobe. But when he started asking questions about how the clothes were made and the impact of the production, no one had answers for him. So he founded Borm Apparel on the principle of transparency and built an entire supply chain from scratch for merino wool. He found a third-generation family farm where the sheep graze on one of two BioGrow certified organic pieces of land in New Zealand, and a mill who has direct relationships with the farmers in the region and has for generations, and a factory in LA that's committed to high labor standards. And he personally visited every link in the chain, learning firsthand about their practices. At the beginning of this year, as part of our first annual retreat, we asked some of the fellows to share their experiences. So on topics like capital raising, on division of roles and partnerships, things like that. Teal shared on traceability. His story inspired and influenced many of the fellows to look into their own supply chains. Like Mac, I mentioned, was on his way to China right now to do just that. On the flip side, from Mac alone, Teal has learned about packaging, labeling, tracking production, the back end of his website. Also at the retreat, we did this needs exchange with the fellows and thought maybe they'd satisfy about one-third of each other's needs. Instead, almost all of them are fulfilled. And that's powerful, because all of a sudden, the mentors are no longer the prime knowledge holders in the room. Their peers are. One of the common needs was help with QuickBooks. And as it turns out, there are fellows who love QuickBooks and totally geek out on it. Who knew? <laughs> Before we knew it, they had planned a QuickBooks party. Yes, you heard me. <laughs> it's amazing. But, <laughs> but one of my favorite moments was at the very end of the day, when we were eating our last meal together. I looked across the sea of tables, and they were all empty. At breakfast, people were scattered in twos and threes. And I turned around and saw this. Everyone hogpiled around the three tables in the corner of the room. And after a day of sharing and connecting, of being part of each other's stories, they couldn't bear to be apart. These are the moments I live for. Melt my heart. Magic. In our monthly town halls, we continue to build on this knowledge exchange. People want to help and share what they know. And generosity begets generosity. At the BFDA, you can see the whole cycle 
from idea to prototype to production to market, all under one roof. And what this does is it helps you de-risk products iteratively and quickly, literally just down the hall. Mandy wanted to take her knitwear brand, Cordal, into Wovens. It's a whole brand new category for her. The idea of working with new construction techniques and fabric vendors for the first time was really daunting, let alone finding a factory that would take her seriously, especially because she wasn't producing a huge minimum. Tara, in our S lab, worked with Mandy on sourcing fabrics, and because Tara knows Mandy and her style, her recommendations were spot on. And she saved Mandy a ton of time. Mandy then worked closely with our pattern maker to turn her idea into a salesman sample. And when questions arose, Mandy walked down the hall and they could talk about it. This proximity and those relationships made the process manageable and saved her time and money. And now, Mandy has the confidence to experiment more and to take greater risks. These wovens fleshed out her knitwear collection, making it easier to merchandise. And this past season, her business grew by leaps and bounds. In fact, she has an upcoming collaboration with a certain hot Michigan brand, so keep an eye out for that. Because our entrepreneurs' teams extend to everyone in our ecosystem, from the researchers in the S Lab to the 3D print technicians, and even the greater community who attend our events, they're not alone. The era of the lone genius is over. You're not isolated. You don't have to have all the answers. Consider everyone in your ecosystem as a valued, respected member of your team, and share your vision, and be open. We're only a small group of entrepreneurs, and we're learning and exploring every day. We're also designers. And designers drive consumer culture and are responsible for most of the world we touch and see. But at its core, design is about challenging norms and questioning standards. We have a focus on fashion because it's an industry that's often overlooked in these conversations. And given that apparel is second only to oil as the world's most polluting industry, and two years after the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh, which killed over 1,100 garment factory workers and injured 2,500 more, these are conversations we should all be having. At the BFDA, our tagline is make the future here. And today, I'm asking all of you to support young designers who are making our future everywhere. Thank you. Where do you come from?